Hello everyone, today we talk about medieval cities um, between continuity and change. So a bit of um, historiographical debate relatively to the persistence of uh, urban uh, settlements and, and their transformation throughout, especially the first, um, I wouldn't say first and central um, uh, centuries of the Middle Ages. Um, <coughs> so this is very likely going to be a probably a shorter wi video than the usual because I'm not mm, so, so versed into such uh, general and generalist, let's say, mm, uh, topics as uh, I obviously my, my contents are always kind of generalist but this one is really looking at the thing at the limit of rarefaction and uh, as I often say in my videos I try to always to make you see that there is something a lot more to go in depth into these um, topics. It's not just to do what I say to, to sum up the situation and the beauty of the Middle Ages stands according to me um, <coughs> exactly to the uh, singular local realities. Mm -hmm. So this is something maybe I will do on Schwerpunkt one day when I will have got the essential <laughs> Right, I don't know how how long it's gonna gonna take some some year probably, a uh, few years at least, um, but nevertheless, um, this is can be equally useful also to to get a bit of historiographical perception. I mean, how has been really the uh, debate relatively to this transformation, and 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 also in here I will not uh, try I, I will try not to make um, <coughs> names. Obviously, we will talk about Piren. That is kind of the uh, cornerstone for any uh, historiographical consideration on on the topic of development of um, you know medieval economy and trade et etc and cities and transformation and kind etc um, <coughs> as you know this um, uh, Belgian uh, historian has been a prominent figure uh, in medieval um, uh, historiography. Um, he lived, um, you know, it's one of the those generations that came really before even the ones of our own professors. So he, he died in 1935. He lived uh, essentially second half of the eight, 19th, the first half of the 20th century. And he, uh, he actually wrote a lot of interesting things. Uh, think about um, Muhammad and Charlemagne. Um, think about, in fact, the, the so-called Pirenne's uh, thesis um, that f is relative, especially to the um, not just to this phenomenon we will talk today, but also really to understand it has also periodizing meaning. You know, wh when does the Middle Ages really start, and how can we observe that? Um, <coughs> then he had uh, other knowledge about, particular knowledge about Belgian. Mm, medieval history that no, we will skip um, and uh, he was uh, involved also uh, you know when when the Germans occupied Belgium uh, during World War I he was also a sort of a, uh, of a non-violent activist and these are kind of details just to make you understand how actually far in time that is <laughs> from now, I mean not so far actually think even uh, 2000 years ago after all it wasn't such a long time ago but um, still a historian that um, made um, really had a, a huge influence on, on medieval historiography and that we and that his ideas um, uh, kind of still live on in and in, in are a point of reference in order to criticize to to, to go on um, <coughs> by the way I, I liked him as a I like him as a, as a he was an historian as a um yeah, as an individual um <coughs> however I've not <laughs> got myself totally interested in his thesis because I always considered them skipped but I I like how sometimes um <coughs> these big mm, say macroscopical historiographical interpretations have been sometimes kind of just criticized point, you know, wh when you hear Piran, think of all about all the memes that <laughs> exist on him, I actually haven't checked, but I can imagine, um, you know, it's uh, the guy who basically has said something, 
um, interesting, but his um, thesis had to be reintegrated and uh, re, um, you know, reformulated with uh, the uh, discoveries of the, the new, the, the latest historiographical discoveries. Um, <coughs> so there is this tendency nowadays to to getting to grow increasingly specialized into something, and this is something I, I really don't like because I find it extremely boring. Um, this is perhaps my limit because. Um, uh, well, I also unavoidably had to, to, to increasingly specialize in what they do, um, and then I kind of started also understanding why. But I think that history is interesting because you can really space a lot. I mean, what's the point of, you know, getting so mm, specialized in such a narrow and niche-like uh, topic, um, maybe even becoming the full expert, the greatest expert in that field, and publishing things only on that thing, and, and in the meanwhile not knowing all the rest. And this is how the academy is really transforming itself into, because um, <coughs> that's mostly a sort of economical reason, first of all, and this is what should never enter into the um, into the academy, in my opinion. Um, but also it's a tendency uh, that objectively comes from this need of, you know, given that we have such, we have had um, such um, big historiographical constructions uh, from especially these great historians of the 19th and the, say, first half of the 20th century, um, <coughs> we, we have really a lot of fertile ground to say, okay, let's not just invent something new, but just unavoidably go look what has already been written, has already been conceived, and just let's uh, tear this apart. I mean, let's, um, I mean, not tear this apart, but let's say, let's really go make a <coughs> surgical, uh, surgical um, uh, analysis of, of all of this, and so bit by bit let's um, kind of reformulate it in, in a more up-to-date way. Which is definitely fine, but at the same time, there is also, in my opinion, a two unidirectional um, tendency to do just that. And, and historians sometimes s stop essentially considering the broader problems as as they are. And personally, I've, I've ne and this has is my criticism also towards the way history is taught. Um, <coughs> also at universities, because universities um, give you uh, essentially a, in the first year, let's say a manualistic, let's say a, a basic knowledge of certain, of the field you're going to study. Mm -hmm. And it's so basic that also in here it's at the limit of rarefaction. Mm -hmm. It's not um, something, by the way, you're also going to, um <coughs> you know, if you study um, just to make you an ex a practical example, if you study, I don't know, the, the, basi <coughs> the, basics exam the basic exam of medieval history, there are things that, quite likely, about the Middle Ages that you're going to study very superficially in this exam only on, on such occasion. And during the university path, there is basically no occasion to go in-depth to that <coughs> at any time. Uh, therefore, you grow specialized into something but at the same time you completely lose the uh, you completely get out of touch with the rest of of of, of the whole story let's say um <coughs> i say it myself i've been working with very um with very um um <coughs> important let's say very very with some of the greatest experts of certain topics of medieval history that exist in the world and 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 what surprised me is that these people yeah they were surely as professors they had a culture they had a knowledge they they knew of a freaking lot of things that I didn't, but sometimes they they lacked the essentials about other spaces and times compared to the one they were studying, even of the same middle ages. That I said, oh my god, but this person has never got, had the, I don't know whether the curiosity or the chance, because when eventually when you become a professor you also have, you don't have all the time you want. Uh, it, it's a job and 
um, and you can't know everything objectively. You st still have to stick to, to essentially what you have been doing in your PhD, and that's how actually most professors work. There are sometimes um, more polymathic uh, individuals that surely can cover more topics, but really what I've seen tendentially is this um, absurd um, hyper specialization that makes uh, professors growing com increasingly unaware of the of the rest of history and of history in the first place because I believe that history is useful as long as you can teach it to someone. I mean it can be useful to you as well so you can teach it by yourself if you start it but the objective, you know, I mean, the, the real gain that the society can have is really to talk, um, um, to talk about um, history to other people and, and, and let these people know, you know, let these people think something that has already been, um, you know, put under test essentially through your your learning through your research and that you can give them as an already cooked and um <laughs> meal and that they can consume even though that's not excessively healthy because those people are um obviously not making that the same effort that you have done to understand that so the risk naturally is that as it always happens, that people just want to hear what historians know. Be the historians know because they think that that's the truth, and 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 simply because a historian said that, then it means that it is true. As a matter of fact, especially in recent years, I've I've seen a lot of even prominent, famous historians um, lending themselves for t t to initiatives that were, according to me, very ideological. Um, and I've seen, I haven't seen just professors, I've seen even military men, I've seen, <coughs> you know, people you you wouldn't expect that from, you know, to say, look, I'm an expert in this field, so just take my opinion as, uh, as a matter of fact. I mean, the, the first thing um, I like to do as a historian is to tell people, look, do not believe everything I tell you. Mm -hmm. Just go f figure that out by yourself, because that's actually the only useful part of the story. I mean, history is theoretically something we could even invent. You know, if it was just a matter of sheer knowledge, if it was like a fairy tale, like a story, if, um, uh, it could be just uh, an equally valid exercise if, uh, by certain standards. You can do that with literature, for instance. So there are e in fantasy worlds on their own, you can scope, etc. But history has the important value that it's based on um, <coughs> checkable f um, evidence. So, if you are told to look at that evidence, knowing that there is that evidence that you can formulate essentially an opinion on your own about it, well, that's really the goal of history. History, even as a word, is always is always confused, um, uh, as if that equated to a story. You know, history is as if someone had written it, uh, this book, and, th and that's what you have to stick to. This is not meaning of history. The, me the actual meaning of history, as as a word, linguistically speaking, is research. So it doesn't tell you. Uh, it, it it doesn't talk about contents. It, it talks about method, mm -hmm. and that's what you have to get. A valid method. Th uh, history teaches you how to look at things autonomously. And that's the big difference, and many people don't get this. They skip the process. They think just because something it's history. Um, it has to be true. No, history should teach you to essentially make your own history. I know it sounds bad <laughs> also in revisionistic and uh, perspective, but that's not truly really the point. Maybe one day we'll make a video about that. I mean, it's not that you have to make your own history because you have, you know, to invent a completely different history. Um, you have to make your own history, meaning that you have to make your own research mm, and trying to refine your critical skills, your ability of understand Nick. Excuse me a drink once again. So why all this premise? Because um, I think it's um, it's useful to look at history in broader perspective and I think that if you really want to learn history you should 
I mean, and you're not a historian, so you're not gonna make a you know a living out of it. Um, you should get first things first as really the essentials. So not g going. I mean, you can't obviously study already something in, in depth naturally. I think everybody that also approaches history autonomously always uh, it's more likely to come from from the let's say from the detail that from the essential and that's also a problem in fact so my suggestion is always you know pick up a, a manual of, of of history assuming it's a good manual because also certain manuals are kind of uh, I've read certain things also from other mm, places of the world I, I don't really like them um, and find a manual that is serious you know that talks really already somewhat in depth to what um, you're interested in I mean in depth mean meaning with criticism meaning with um, objectivity and try to um, avoid those books that are um to base on kind of the emotional side of the story sometimes i've read certain ma manuals that i don't know where that was it was a british one a medieval history a very recent one so a very up to date one and i disliked it completely because um i mean it, it was interesting actually I, I can't say i disliked it completely actually it was a a good manual after all but i found absurd how certain topics were completely escaped how there was a mostly a conceptual understanding of the Middle Ages. I mean, that is useful, indeed, but you also have to know the story. You know, you can't make it just a matter of um, uh, you know, of concepts not really listing the... This is kind of a fault of a, a bit of old manuals, in, this, in, the, in the sense that the manual, uh, unless it's not something extremely um schematic it's uh, it rarely can be all about facts because <laughs> that wouldn't be a manual anymore but at least to focus on certain a comprehensive picture of the middle ages not just those single topics those single conceptions, the single historiographical problems, and then lacking even the most elementary knowledge of the history of a certain area of, in this case of, uh, you know, if you take the European Middle Ages of Europe and its history, because you, you still have to know those essentials. And <coughs> I think in the past, um, people studied more these things when studying history. Um, today it's all more conceptual and from one side it's good and I realize my criticism actually comes from also for, from cultural reasons in the sense that uh, I come from a country into which this kind of notionism um, uh, is still alive as a model um, and mm, sometimes this leads also to a bit of um, conceptual confusion uh, because um, you get this essentially this sum of information that are really a very solid in structural chain but also in there you may especially if you approach that for the first time uh, on a manual that can be first of all a lot to learn but uh, secondly you know that there is so, mu so, so many new things to learn that you don't can get a hierarchy of the um, of what you have to learn however um, I still think um, a good manual should really combine both things. I mean, it should be conceptual, but also make a lot of examples um, and to stick to a bodily uh, mm, synthesis of history. You know, we're not really skipping the um, the, for instance, the the data and names. There is this idea. Oh, history is not about data and names. No, history is about uh, dates and names, or not uh, not data. Um, and 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 it couldn't be otherwise. You know, if you if you don't know when when England was conquered by the Normans, uh, if you don't know when when the Gregorian reforms occurred, you know, if you if you don't have such solidly spatial and temporal understanding of the Middle Ages or you don't want to do that in any, any type of history, just don't study history. 
because this is also another plain stupid novelty that we have to know everything has to be a concept it's not important uh, no it did there have to be both. It's like the, those uh, idiots who say that um, you know humanistic subjects cannot uh, you know uh, and and you know are, are are better than scientific subjects or vice versa. No, you, if you want to be a complete individual, you have necessary to know to know both of them. So never take these directions that seems more enticing, more because sometimes those are done objectively even with a good purpose you know the idea of talking especially to the youngers with with a language that is more um, suitable for them but um, that is anything the consequence of a educational failure in my opinion and that can be a way to partially fix that but only where the problem is already caused I mean while you are doing your education you should be already provided with such informations um, and it's increasingly difficult. This is also another very sad <laughs> chapter of the story, but nevertheless very, very real. Um, the so well, I don't know what I'm started to talk about this, but the the point I wanted to make, relatively especially to Piran Tezis, is the the one that even these all the historiographical concepts are are partially overlooked today mm -hmm. sometimes it happened to me to you know it, it's normal when you when you arrive to at university you you have some es i mean this happened for me i had some essentials that were actually quite solid already at the time and i didn't know that because i was not aware of what um real history i mean you want you, you learn at university really was then you kind of get satisfied obviously by the fact you, you already know something however what what polarizes your attention what seems to you so um fascinating uh, is when you naturally enter in you get in touch with something new something different with different interpretations um, that really sometimes are mind blowing at the beginning because you you didn't expect that and you start learning how certain things happen you start uh, start to acquire a certain um, lexicon you uh, you like that and you tend to become a sort of iconoclast uh, because you say well this is not how it, 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 this was told to me how this is taught in schools, how you hear people talking about this, this is all, all different and you like to stress this difference and to use that this approach um, a bit to everything like you don't it, and partially you stop to even learn because you're more interested about the concept than about the evidence then after some time after some years you study you actually start coming back on your previous thoughts and and you realize that many things that even you had you have yet criticized in the very last years were a bit more like you had thought them before to be and you start realizing something impressive that actually in part you had got certain concepts m m more correctly let's say than what you before I mean even studying history then at university then then after and so you start reconsidering even these big historiographical con and old naturally big and old um, historiographical interpretations because after all you realize you know what this guy was essentially right it may be naturally you can hear I don't know lots of different um, even just the difference in in time I mean how these people wrote you know uh, it's evident that you start reading someone who lived 100 years ago he he, he expresses uh, himself or herself in very different ways than you you do now so you already understand why sometimes uh, because of uh, I don't know na national reasons uh, political reasons of some kind of cultural reasons etc um, <coughs> there are also very different things these 
people looked at. But essentially, th there's still the same kind of uh, curiosity and interest towards that historical period, and essentially the same kind of degree of neutrality by certain standards to to that topic. And I mean, certain things that you had deemed now at that at this point to, to, to be stereotypical, you realize that in part they actually were true because when you start reading the sources, uh, when you start reading the sources. That's the point. That's when you start reading uh, the sources, you realize those sources state exactly that. So, <laughs> it's true, the sources do not state everything, the sources have to be interpreted, the sources have to be handled with great care. But if they give us a picture of something, that that picture is still essentially what we got. Uh, either if we are from the 21st century or if we are from the 19th century. They're essentially saying the same evidence. And this is valid especially for those uh, these times like the ancient world, the ancient world especially as you can imagine, but also the Middle Ages, in the sense that, yeah, we have been discovering now up to now also lots of other evidence of, of, of very varied kind, by the way. However, it's not that we have rewritten history. You know, it's not that the Middle Ages went in a radically different way from from the, you know, that I don't know. The, the way it was known in the 19th century is essentially had the way it's known still today. It's just we have gone a bit deeper into certain questions. We have observed them um, from different perspectives because that's ultimately what happens, and that's something that will never cease to exist into history. Because even if one day we will kind of cover more or less all the perspectives, um, the what really matters is that these perspectives are is historically determined. So every time a in in history will have its particular look to to history. Um, and, it w and and this interest will, I I the interest in such perspective will be revived. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we see, in fact, that uh, also in the past there have been there has been a swinging towards uh, this or that direction. So that um, there have been s certain perspectives in history that kind of emerged every once in a while that were surpri surprisingly similar to one to the other. Now we have arrived to a point of historical uh, historiographical development to which really it's difficult to find especially for a time like the middle ages uh, something that's not really already been touched either you go into an archive which i personally hate and I try to avoid in every possible way um so that to find new sources but those are mostly leftovers. They're minutiae. I mean, they, they you can't look at them, but okay, you're not gonna to going to rewrite history in this sense, and that's the reason why I think that these big historiographical perspectives are kind of interesting because you can play with them, because they are so complex indeed that you can get your mind lost into them. In in today's case, uh, we talk about parents. Um, interpretation of the evolution of the cities um, in the essentially in the centuries following the, the, the fall of the Western Roman Empire mm -hmm. the or better the, the fall of the Roman Empire in the West <laughs> as there was nothing like properly as a Western Roman Empire this is I, I like to to emphasize that um, the so Piran essentially believed, you know, that there is this mm, this major watershed um, caused by the Arab invasions, mm -hmm. because Piran basically believed that up to the Arab invasions, the Mediterranean kind of worked like it had always been especially in trade and all, and uh, the Arabs at a certain point arrive and everything is shut down. And the Middle Ages begin because that's what makes the wolf, you know, late antique civilization crumble. This never existed historically speaking. First of all, 
previous to the Arab advance, the contraction of um, trade, of, you know, volumes of trade was was already enormous. Uh, I mean, it was at least something really sensible. The the Arabs caused a political f- fracture of the Mediterranean, indeed. But this political fracture arguably didn't... Uh, first of all, it, it surely didn't stop trade. Mm-hmm. Because that was still the major activity, even before war, that existed in the med- medieval Mediterranean, when, especially when the, the, the Islamic powers were on, on, on the offensive. Uh, and it always remained, but in general, you know, you don't just trade. Uh, you don't. You don't just make war. You need necessarily to trade at a point. And the Arabs have always kept trading with the West. And arguably, the Mediterranean was this just um, extremely syncretic sea where, by nature, everyone would communicate and trade and share and so on. Um, and not even in the uh, moment of maximum contraction of um, European economies never been a end of international trade, over in, even over intercontinental trade. You know, if you find um, certain, um, f- for instance, um, certain blue that you can in in, in uh, er early medieval manuscripts and you know that that blue or, or only came from a certain region of uh, Afghanistan where the word is lapis uh, lazuli uh, that was were able to to produce that color you say this freaking thing came from Afghanistan and not only that but you also by the way Afghanistan is the key eventually for countries like India and China and obviously, those inter uh, th- those regions were always in contact with Europe uh, at all time in the near Middle East at all time. But not only th- th- there had to be someone, first of all, who had gone something in exchange for those lapis lazuli, who had brought them in Europe, who and there was someone who had know how to work them, how to produce that um, powder for the for, for the color, how to draw, how to and and. Therefore, you realize that there was a sort of big um, um, uh, um, I don't know how to say that uh, sort of s- um, of um, of spin-off uh, how you how you want to call it around uh, around this that uh, that we can't see because maybe the sources have not given that to us but that definitely are self-evident as those lapis lazuli didn't come on that um, um, illuminated manuscript by themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's an indirect evidence, for instance. But aside from this, um, Piran um, had uh, in his mind the idea that the cities of the Mediterranean and of Europe, generally speaking, had an eminently commercial function. So, therefore, by believing that the Arabs shut, uh, shut uh, the Mediterranean down, mm-hmm. shut the Mediterranean trade down, unavoidably, from the 7th century, therefore, the cities had to fall. Mm-hmm. The, the cities had fallen in some measure. Mm-hmm. So, Piran was suggesting that the uh, it's as if these cities had li- been living just of trade and the trade ends so the city collapses in some way and according to Piran these centers became they transformed themselves in simple um, settlements protected by walls and essentially qualitatively not different from any other kind of demic agglomeration in the rest of the territory. So, incidentally, you know, rural settlements uh, in this sense. So that the city itself, mm, in spite of its infrastructures, of the ancient times still being there, etc., would shrink to something much smaller and essentially not um, 
and is homogeneous from um, the uh, from the rest of any other can say any other rural settlement proper, but in in in, in the essentially in, in the essentials really remaining something without devoid of other functions mm. aside this one you know uh, our community staying together in around into a fortified center and nothing else so this naturally, according to Perrin, went along with other transformations. So, first of all, how much is this true, really? We have seen it isn't, as trade has um, definitely re remained at, at all times, but it is true, however, that the volumes of traffic were surely decreased. So, it is obvious that certain, by a certain extent, even such an interpretation is not... I mean, if you don't interpret it categorically, it's not tendentially so wrong. Mm. What is wrong about it is really not understanding the dynamism of the countryside in part. As it is true that the, um, how you want to call it, the decadence, the, the, the collapse of the late antique world existed. Sometimes it was also something very brutal. You know, there were certain regions of Europe that kind of uh, fell pretty, pretty, pretty quickly, pretty with through massive destructions, etc. But also in here, it wasn't ex excessively um, frequent. For instance, if you, if you really think about it, the place that really underwent the major destructions from this point of view was uh, the Italian peninsula, because in The the Arabs in Spain, um, you know, f first of all, Spain had didn't have anything particularly destructive that happened to her during late antique and early medieval times. Then, even when the Arabs arrive, there is a sort of contraction because the whole Eurasian economy was contracting because of the epidemics, because of the uh, other changes. But so, but the Arabs, however, built into the Iberian Peninsula practically the only um, centralized state existing in Europe besides the uh, the Eastern Roman uh, the Eastern Roman Empire or the Roman Empire to say better um, Gaul kind of um, yeah we, we're talking naturally about all the European regions were kind of devastated by a certain extent but um, what I'm stressing here is how brutal this passage could really be so to to see how the, the transformation really occurred more quickly Gaul also didn't un undergo very massive um, and brutal changes Britain did Britain was also in here the Anglo-Saxon invasions and do not have to be taken as um, something so disastrous as we imagined them um, but say better that for Britain that was a land that wasn't excessively Romanized. So even the fall of Roman Britain was something more uh, you know, it was um easier to do <laughs> by certain standards. So also in there the destructions probably were not so massive as we imagined. I mean it was just Britain to be relatively lightly romanized uh, especially in certain areas telling the truth because others were otherwise relatively well romanized uh, the byzantine empire lost lots of territories but also in there the arabs basically substituted to the empire and they started to build centralized systems on their own so nothing like in Latin Germanic Europe, Italy was objectively the place where the ma the, the, gr the greatest destructions took place, and where things were kind of built from scratch on other bases. So Italy probably is one of the most important, one of the most fascinating places to look at, if you want to see this passage of re um, uh, you know of reconstruction of uh, even on the settlements. Mm -hmm. So it is true, there are things like, you know, it's obvious that uh, the trade contracted, that there was a greater um, uh, attention towards fortified centers, that 
uh, where uh, there was most of an agricultural economy kicking in, but also in there you find there was a lot of dynamism actually. Um, n not even all the destructions of the sixth century could actually take uh, Italy the, you know, for instance, the, the fact of having the highest uh, wealth per capita at that time. Um, so there was also in there a greater din dynamism. So not necessarily a there was a decadence, definitely a contraction, better called, but. There was at the same time the ability to recon to, to rebuild from f on, on other premises. Mm -hmm. And this change perhaps happens. Surely all over Western Europe what you see is the the diocese um, um say the city with a diocese and a fortified wall is kind of the the elementary urban center. Mm -hmm. That's something you find everywhere from England to Italy to from Spain to Western Germany. That's what you have. Um, there is... Um, um, so this is by the way very important because it also tells you in there that those cities had not died out. Mm -hmm. Especially Episcopal power was very strong in, in its ability to organize the society, to protect it, to defend it. Um, I mean, the urban society. Excuse me, a drink once again. And this reveals that the city had the, resor the necessary resources to keep that up, and that these resources evidently didn't come from from the city itself, but also from the power that from th from the city was extended over the sur surrounding countryside, mm -hmm. because you cannot read, uh, you know, I history as if these cities were self-standing. I mean, even if looking at the, uh, at the wealthiest um, mercantile republics of the lower Middle Ages, what you see is that yeah, they made a freaking lot of money through trade, but still the main base of power was the countryside, the, the agricultural resources, and it could it could have not been otherwise, really. Um, so, from from this, you realize that the city al already was part of a st of a broader structure, around which gravitated many parts of of, of, of society. Mm. Naturally. Um, also in here there are differences in Europe. For instance, um, the mm, especially once again the example of Italy is important because Italy was a place where, for instance, the countryside had basically never been detached from the cities. Mm -hmm. Even in the early Middle Ages, you don't find in Italy a place where basically the local peasants didn't weren't involved into some kind of activity that involved the cities in some measure. In countries like France uh, and Germany, instead, even up to relatively late in the Middle Ages, you find this, and, and even beyond, telling the truth, you find the world of the forest, you find certain communities that were completely undetached from the urban centers. Mm -hmm. um, this is interesting because that also produced a different kind of society that ex with different expressions and so on. Um, if you take the, f the far north of Europe, you see in there that there weren't even proper cities for a very long time. The same goes for the Eastern, war, uh, Eastern Europe. Um, so it is really a bit so naturally a lot has to do with Roman Europe mm -hmm. with the difference between those areas that had been part of the Roman Empire and those who hadn't um, <coughs> and I say this um, all the time at, at uh, all the times at this point is that the Romans uh, this is not you know something random it's not that the Romans actually built that from scratch the Romans had their own very F functional and effective political and social model they built up their empire on on this 
certain chain of cities, etc. But still, these cities were built and the empire expanded accordingly only into those areas that could sustain environmentally a urban society. If you wonder why the Romans stopped to places like Scotland or Germany or they didn't go in the far, you know, in the south of, uh, say, south in, in, in Africa, or um, it, it's because those were areas that could not sustain the model that the Romans were pushing for. It was mostly an environmental reason. And naturally, also the p the populations that inhabited in these areas weren't practically Romanizable. <laughs> um, at least the Romans tried, but they saw that it wasn't feasible, so they they kind of abandoned it. I will say here there is not probably this huge determinism involved, but you know it's kind of naive to think that the Roman military might would have not been able to conquer a place like Scotland. It's simply that the Romans made a simple pragmatic cost uh, um, benefit uh, costs ben benefits ratio and said okay this is not worth it because by the way we have better things to, to, to think about like I don't know the eastern frontier um, and um, so and, and by the way the Roman Empire in this sense had an infrastructural physical limit but at the same time it still extended, extended its power far beyond that mm. uh, there was not a border out of which there was no Rome. Rome had this massive fallout up to the Urals um, and everybody gravitated around that. Mm -hmm. So e that even the Romans didn't know certain peoples that practically were still into their orbit indirectly. You can see that easily through archaeology, material culture and so on. So, however, the Roman infrastructures, the Roman uh, sur survived they were reused uh, naturally, they were um, adapted. Um, the same Roman city naturally transformed um, itself. And it is true what Piran says that um, there was a contraction also of urbanism as w it was known in, in Roman times. It's kind of self evident. Um, uh, during early medieval times, the cities began to. Uh, even the center of the urban life kind of shifted before it was in the forum. So in this square that was used for the market and um, and um, you know affairs and, and business and so, so, so something like that. Then eventually you see you know during the early Middle Ages that maybe you know the, the, this sh this center was shifted somewhere else, huh? maybe around the church, maybe around. Other, uh, also the collapse of the aqueduct systems was something that brought to certain transformations. If you take Rome, for instance, the the the, the same Rome. Um, first of all, there was a lot of during, uh, you know, by the sixth century, Rome had, uh, especially during the Gothic War, there was a point of it to which even the inhabitants all fled. All fled. So this is a moment in which um, the city gets very much transformed. The Romans had not gone living uh, into that marshy area on, in the north of the um, capital, around the Tiber uh, River, because it was so swampy and um, unhealthy and so on. But when because they could get water simply from the aqueducts. Uh, when the aqueducts collapsed, because they went destroyed during the war, uh, well, <laughs> the population needed water, so they, they started to go in there, so to, to dwell into those areas as well. And it didn't matter that there were floods mm -hmm. constantly, as they, they existed still in Imperial Rome uh, in the day, but, um, you know, there is a logic behind that, and th there is a logic of how these settlements evolved. But still, there is a continuity of from of from the previous um, uh, from the previous urban settlement, and we can't talk about a, a real watershed, but rather a transformation and evolution. Mm -hmm. It is true that also. Um, certain um, settlements were starting to be built uh, uphill, especially the, um, because of the invasions, and um, th there are more fortified centers 
um, in, in, in it is true that medieval cities sometimes developed on on, on that part rather than in the, the, in the previous one. So it's interesting to see, but you have to to look at every single city and see how that evolved. Mm -hmm. There were cities, um, there were Roman cities that were abandoned, for instance. <laughs> Excuse me. Probably not completely, but still, you know for some reason because that center wasn't kind of useful anymore for some of those uh, for for some for some reason so according to Piran the revival of trade that occurred according to him thanks to these kind of heroic figures of the merchants that put everything in motion so this is another this is yeah this is completely wrong uh, because it stresses too much the mercantile initiative as a kind of a strange um, you know solitary um, event that uh, no w we know today that evidently the revival of many of the high middle ages was due to the countryside mm. and without that uh, and also thanks to, to the feudal system uh, that put in motion new capitals to try to rationalize the expenses and, and so on, the, the investments and so on. And that's only at that point that merchants and biz other businessmen come in and say, okay, I'm going to take care of this and start shifting this. Um, say, not start to shift because this has also never happened. Uh, goods have always traveled. But that necessarily trade and commerce became more more developed. Um, so the idea of Pirene is that around this episcopal f fortified center, basically the 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 the, m the merchants began to to to, s to settle and to basically um, started their um, their activity. Stressing especially the idea of the fortification. I mean, the idea that the the, the city walls um, were this kind of um, precondition for, for trade to happen. Um, it is true that at this time certain centers were definitely more fortified than they were in the past. That even certain city walls that had remained were naturally something massive considering the early medieval economical potential um, so that they definitely helped to certain centers to, to maintain a degree of prestige it's pretty obvious but trade also in here as we said it's something that really died that never actually died out in that the overall transformation of trade uh, uh, I mean uh, the, mm, the the com uh, the economical revival of Europe began because it was th the countryside that began to be become more dynamic mm -hmm. and therefore it's not just about the city as you know this safe fortified place um, because also the castles had a, a role into this outside the city naturally or even within because um, but uh, Piran was stressing, in fact, the kind of the union between the two concepts. You know, from one side, the ca you know, uh, between the castrum, so and and, and the burgos. Mm. These are respectively a Latin. I mean, there are two Latin names, but one comes from Latin and another comes from German. And they stress essentially this way because the cast uh, the castrum was the castle essentially, while the the Burgos was the town, mm. was a mostly a sort of kind of. Um, it probably had a already a kind of fortified exception because the term burg actually comes from a settlement that somehow was um, theoretically a still part of this migration era world where. There was a degree of militarization. There was entrenched camps where around which a certain population population began to dwell. But eventually, in, into high medieval Latin, this kind of began to determine, you know, the castrum, the eminently military 
structure in the Burgos, like the 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 civil uh, civil settlement, but they could be indeed they could be kind of the same thing as Piran says. But at the same time, there is always this differentiation, mm-hmm. so that the Burgos obviously had some degree of fortification, just like the Castrum, but uh, they were still centers that developed in in very d- in different ways. Um, in part, and there were so many different shades of this. Um, and this would happen essentially after the tenth century. Mm-hmm. So. This is part of essentially what the uh, thesis of Piran is really about. So stressing so much the importance of trade mm. as a kind of pivotal factor into the uh, revival of of medieval Europe. Today we consider it the contrary. You know, the revival occurred. I mean, the trade was a consequence of that revival, and not the other way around, but uh, without wanting to naturally take any merit out of the dynamism, the entrepreneuriality of um, medieval merchants, etc., but really still stressing the the structural premises for for that to to happen, Mm -hmm. because those are not things that start happening from one day to another just because you're you know, someone wants to make money mm. uh, one day. So, naturally, yeah, you can argue that it's always the same thing. Obviously, also developments elsewhere be- happened because <laughs> people wanted to make money, but they still needed um, the... Uh, th- there are there have to be preconditions, even environmental ones, in order for certain things to, to happen. So later studies have instead demonstrated naturally um, this was mostly kind of wrong. We can understand Piran's perspective though as, as strictly from a Belgian perspective because looking at the uh, Flanders and the uh, Northern Europe in general. Um, you realize that uh, definitely well y- Roman urbanization f- first of all h- was pretty low mm-hmm. was or, or even not existent naturally in some areas so this idea that mm, there was a also a kind of more well, perhaps this is a too far interpretation, but let's say that trade was definitely felt as a, especially given the size into which it increased in in the to northern Europe, especially after after a certain point during the High Middle Ages, is definitely something new, because Northern Europe, uh, up to that time, historically speaking, had not had, and was actually the, the most depressed area of Europe. And the mm, therefore it's very important, especially in Carolingian times, how the traffic instead from Flan- between the Flanders and the, the, with the North Sea, etc., began to rise, mm-hmm. and how Northern economy kind of had this very big impulse mm-hmm. um, so Piran was stressing this passage and saying look at how what trade did because essentially what not the Romans had managed to do there it's what the medievals did that because it was thanks to this um, trade activity that made eventually I don't know the Flanders especially to develop so much in that area because um, between the 11th and 12th centuries uh, the, the uh, in those regions um, the city was born as something extremely new mm-hmm. as a novelty mm-hmm. while in the areas that had been colonized by the Romans um, 
the city had kind of always been the, the standard thing. Mm -hmm. Just if you take even things like uh, that were also very close to 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 fly, uh, you know, uh, even the same northern France had a certain uh, higher degree than of urbanization, as by as by it wasn't pro it wasn't really one of the most urbanized areas, especially at that point, but kind of there was a different uh, circuit but if naturally if you take uh, Italy or southern France for instance um, in a great part of the Iberian Peninsula you see that the development of the urban centuries uh, excuse me of the urban centers after the year 1000 um, is, is something that really emerged in continuity with with what already existed in there from from centuries. Mm. If not millennia indeed, a millennium. Um, so the you can't really just talk about only about trade when looking at how and why these uh, centers developed because there are naturally many other factors. Um, there may there may be indeed in fact m many different types of settlement um there are even difficult to define i mean it's difficult to frame aside from the the uh, scanny evidence that that exists in, in certain cases even cities like you know take a big city like vienna for instance in in austria well we know fairly now, and that was the the, the major uh, city in, in the um, in the area. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and and we don't know practically anything up to very late in time about how Vien really was. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a difficulty. But in general, it's still also difficult to look in those centers that were already developed how the transformations really occurred um, how this um, city basically evolved um, and and to even determine which was the most important um, which was really the the role that it had there were cities that had an administrative role mm -hmm. others they had a more eminently political one uh, others were uh, very important religious or cultural centers mm -hmm. and um, they could be all together as most of the times so actually this is um, what the city was really about and as such uh, we have seen it it was the seat of a diocese uh, there was a market it was uh, therefore it was a religious center there were certain public uh, rights attached to to that city um, in the feudal hierarchy um, and there were uh, other activities that were forming uh, um, from the surplus that uh, was available thanks to trade so the crafts the arts so also uh, culture and art literature um, things like these were starting to, to, to develop uh, so what is a city? This is the point. What, what does really make a city? And how would you say, well, this is just a burg or a little town or a village and this is a city? Because also in here, uh, it really depends. Because if you, I don't know, if you take England, I don't know, in, in there, basically the, the the only major I mean it, it really depends on the standards this is the, the point I'm making but the, the only major real city in there was London let's be honest about it at least from a certain point onwards and um, and until the Industrial Revolution in England the only true city was as a matter of fact London as a main center as some the rest of this population was uh, of European population was quite it was rural at all times so the major, um, you know, th there were lots of centers that were also born from these, uh, of cities that were born from these rural centers. Sometimes there were uh, communes that were created from the union of, of peasant villages, for instance. Um, so 
certain cities evolved from that and and, and, and the problem is where you know when where that's that becomes a city indeed and you still can see that in you know if you travel across Europe um, you see you can recognize kind of the from the outlook of, 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 a, of a city and how it's built w what was the major thing you know if there is a citadel uh, if it's instead something more rural uh, in a plain with you no know, um, there are uh, cities that were originated they, they didn't have even the, the during the Middle Ages a typical cathedral if you go to Compiègne, for instance, was there was surprised because <laughs> by that, um, uh, or um, there are cities that uh, were formed, for instance, um, as suburbs of castles. Uh, this is something interesting. Uh, uh, these castles were, um, and also in here, maybe there was a previous Roman settlement. There was abandoned people went living in, in, in uh, you know on this high ground where there was fortified and then the castle was built on upon then however in later times maybe the 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 suburbs that were part of the ancient Roman settlement began once again to populate and and the center was in this sense shifted in, in, in into there again so it's very difficult to understand what a city is at this point as every center has practically its own story and you can't really categorize that if not um, you know with some obvious degree of approximation so s certain scholars have stressed really the, the the moral importance of the city so feeling the city not as something material but rather something spiritual something that pertained to the to the political idea of the city itself as a community mm -hmm. and this is naturally very important because urbanism in the middle ages is something that has produced things like uh, humanism and the renaissance mm -hmm. uh, Italy was a essentially uh, this most advanced place um, in Europe with uh, the were essentially of city states mm -hmm. and even the, the larger political mm, dominations were centered upon the cities France was relatively different from that also in there naturally cities were quite important well they w always were but there was a, a, a more um, kind of a greater emphasis on the feudal structure still also in the rural world um, in some measure so um, the city made a difference in 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 the history of the world um, depending on how it, it 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 developed the the so the, the idea is also that the city was lived in different ways by different people so it, it was very different to be to live in a city if you were a bishop or a diacon for instance um the just think about the the political view that a bishop could have about its own uh, dominion starting from the uh, urban diocese and having this point of reference whereas for the diacon it was mostly a matter of serving the local um, e ecclesiastical administration having a, a living in some way monks that uh, were definitely living mostly especially before the creation of the mendicant orders outside the city were however still visiting cities necessarily for diplomatical I mean certain monks really traveled pretty much pretty extensively uh, so in that sense the city must have appeared to, 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 to this to the monk in a completely different way the Dominicans and Franciscans start to live into the cities and they have already a certain different mindset think about what your mindset uh, would have been if you were a a uh, night uh, at night living in a city mm -hmm. there were 
lots of knights in cities, um, especially in, in the areas of Europe that were more urbanized. The the communal elite was usually uh, of the knight, uh, knightly class. Mm -hmm. So these were extremely wealthy people who had their own um, palaces and towers in the city, their own arsenals, their own uh, retinues, and they they looked at uh, you know this urban um, environment as a place where to to show off their their might to 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 make feasts um, um, in the streets. Um, to participate to to the games to um, to also to to I don't know to make ambushes into the city streets to uh, to the rival rival uh, families and kind of a mobster l life uh, like um, uh, mobster like life life uh, <laughs> what am I saying well you understand you understand if you have patience you understand. Um, thinking, and, and these were essentially military class. Then think about the commoner, the craftsman, the guy who produced, I don't know, uh, pottery or, or even weapons, uh, or I don't know, clothes. Um, what what the mindset? You know, what did the city represent for them? Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, the, the knightly class was a bit across the city and the countryside still. So they had kind of still this feudal mindset in many ways. It still entailed the having not just palaces and towers in, in the city walls, within the city walls, but also castles in, in the countryside. Well, the commoner surely didn't. Uh, he had his house and family in there. Uh, he had his own house uh, that was often the same thing with his own shop. Um, and for instance, he didn't like at all that the uh, knights um, would make a mess in the street when fighting against each other and uh, obliging uh, him to shut down the the the, um, the shop and to you know even to be concerned about his own uh, safety um, because there were fires, for instance, um, a lot were set even to to burn the arrivals. Um, buildings and so on. So these cities were also something we have to imagine in some cases to, to be pretty unstable. Think about uh, think about Milan that was raised to the ground by Frederick Barbarossa and the Milanese. What they do they do? They re rebuild it from scratch in a few years. So just think about in that sense I mean the city not as something yeah of course Milan wasn't completely raised to the ground but still you know, those people looked at the city as the unavoidable model that they wanted to to live in, had at least in the way they had built it in, their, in that way. Um, think about what the city had to, and and this changed a lot in to the politics of the city, as such, has how the commune was created, how even the the and the people who dwelled into the cities and they had a, a civic pride and they wanted to trace that back to the um, classical origins of the city and having and producing chronicles and these are beautiful sources we can all read um, there's a different mindset attached to the city indeed something very diffi difficult to understand for someone who lives into into the countryside doesn't matter whether he's a peasant or a uh, 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 a duke or or a prince, uh, still, uh, it's not about where you live; it's how you live. Um, cities are a bit different all over all over Europe. There were different ways of uh, making cities rise. We will surely discuss this in uh, in um, in other on other occasions. The differences between the cities in countries like uh, France, England, Germany, Italy, Spain, um, because uh, each one had its own model, its own influences, and, and this is reflected also in the socially, socially speaking, uh, because these worlds have, for instance, very different, I mean, not very, very different, but also uh, different um, views of uh, knighthood this is inc incidentally what I was talking about just just yesterday 
um, think about in this sense also what a merchant saw the city like. The merchants at this point began to travel a lot so that actually they didn't leave they always kind of lived in cities to be honest but not always in their own city and they often stayed away for years and years from their own home uh, and because they had to administrate all their business abroad mm -hmm. um, so the city was sometimes just uh, for these people considered as a market square there were lots of um, of bankers that bought houses um, a bit in old cities. Uh, think about the um, uh, London had this uh, beautiful Lombard, um, uh, you know, city. If you go into you know you, many areas of Europe, you you find sometimes in these medieval uh, city centers, uh, you know, street of the Lombards because those were the uh, bankers from. from from northern Italy that had bought houses in there because they were uh, having business in there and they needed to even to uh, not for themselves but also just to have the agents and people who had to work for them in there um, so th there is this very strong corporative um, uh, feeling into uh, you know system in, in to the time for which also in here houses have not to be understood as residences as mere residences, but as a first of all, as part of a wall group of houses of quarters, um, and and then also as um, places of uh, of business of um, of um, of warehouses. Think at all in the Mediterranean uh, or in, on on the North and, and Baltic Sea, or all, all these. Um, um, quarters that were deputed to that particular commercial organization mm -hmm. uh, of merchants that stayed in there. The famous, um, there were quarters of foreigners. This is typical. Uh, we, we mention it now, but uh, think about the uh, the the quarter of the Germans in in Venice. That was so so very important, especially when. The Bavarians began to have increasingly um, developing um, interests with um, with the uh, northern uh, Italian trade. They had their own their own place in there. So it was normal. This is interesting because it makes you understand that in the city in here was being also surpassed as a concept of you know simple enclosure. Mm. There is all a beautiful literature from the French historiography that um, talks about, distresses very much this idea of the city as as the. Um, there is something I've read also about Pier, uh, from Piran about this. Yeah, I don't remember the title now, but you know, distressing the, the idea that the city was for the commoners, especially sort of universe on its own. Just imagine to live in a world to which objectively there are no big cities. So uh, even think about what it what it meant in, in the landscape, you know, to travel as a pilgrim, as a merchant, as as an as a, as a knight, and to see of, th of these uh, limitless green fields of Europe to see a city that was um um you know, uh, was um, standing out, mm -hmm. especially figured these enormous cathedrals that, that are start be built, especially from northern France and 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 and, and England, and that eventually will be exposed. I mean, become to 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 be part of the skyline of all the the major European centers. And, and what it was, even from a sheer material point of view. I mean, the cities were not big. You you see these uh, paintings and engravings. So if we were, um, you know, lucky enough to have lots of that, you see, that it really renders you the idea of a very agricultural world with a city that is also modest, but with this huge cathedral in the middle that you could see from tens of kilometers away. Um, you know, that was a symbol of something. 
for us today, the city is kind of everything we see, because most of us now live in the cities. At uh, the time, most of the people didn't, and and especially there weren't many cities, and they weren't very developed. So if you take, a, just think of what could be to see places like Paris, like Milan, like Rome, like Constantinople. I mean, those were huge cities for those time standards. And there were something incredible, even a, a sort of an attraction in many ways, and that's uh, how they also kept developing uh, in part. Uh, think about what the city in this sense had to look like for a peasant who wanted to escape from his own lord from the countryside. There is a bit of romanticism here involved as the thing really didn't happen like that, but it was said that uh, the uh, breathing the um, the city's air uh, would make you free because it was seemingly I don't remember the source but uh, in some cases at least it was said that if a as a serf um, escaped his own lord into the city and stayed there for one year and one day I think um, without being claimed back by his own lord he was automatically free by right naturally it was a bit more complicated but this is a good example that um, and a metaphor you can um, use um, anecdotally to explain what the the rise of the cities in, 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 in low medieval Europe was really about. I mean, the idea that um, it was a world that was also partly emancipating from from the one of the feudal hierarchy. Mm -hmm. The cities uh, uh, grew as competitors, for instance, of the great um, seigneurial estates, and many uh, lords at this point decided to to become mm, citizens as well. I mean, to to enter in the city. If you consider what the um, communal phenomenon actually originated, well, it wasn't ab about the commoners. It was really about the nobility that entered into the city, given the force of its arms, and began to organize something from from w within. But the great, even the demographical. Um, rise of, of, of Europe at this, uh, excuse me, of the cities at this time um, was actually not due to you know uh, people copulating like rabbits, it was really um, because the potential was still pretty low in terms of, uh, even if you consider the crop rate, it, you couldn't have a staunching uh, increase in, in the overall number of the population, so these cities were already formed Mostly, I mean, they were enlarged uh, the way they be they became in the low middle ages by the uh, immigrants from the countryside, mm -hmm. um, and this was a way even to exploit their force. Um, most of the cities of Europe expanded at this time, also beyond the previous um, the older city wall, um, when basically the city began to host so many workers uh, from the countryside that in the day were working within the city walls but in, in the night they kind of went to sleep uh, in the suburbs that were forming around the city so at a certain point these suburbs began very to be very important because naturally they were the residences of, of the working force of, of the city so they also had some degree of uh, urban development on their own so basically the city and at this point he's usually making a lot of money also thanks to those workers builds up another city wall around the suburbs and therefore you have all these various layers of sometimes of even a tree um, or four even, I don't remember um, city rings uh, um, wall rings um, and, uh, and you can measure in that sense also how the cities um, expanded from a demographical point of view about which we don't really know much because we don't have the, the actual numbers but if you see that you know the city expanded between the I don't know the 11th and the 14th century because there are several city walls that are built uh, in circle all around and that you know obviously in the 14th century the Black Death arrived and the city doesn't re-expand until the 17th century, you know, well, that 
fits, uh, even if you don't know the numbers, you kind of have an idea of what it could really be, approximately, in terms of endemic strength and why that occurred in, in those timing, because it's something you find in so many other circuit for many other centers. Um, so, think about how the city was seen f by these salaried workers that came to work in these major textile uh, industries of um, of uh, the Flanders and of Italy, um, and they were exploited, and um, they somehow also rebelled against the urban uh, oligarchy of the f merchants. Um, I mean, definitely, what is a city at this point? It's something extremely varied. It's something extreme that everybody l really looks upon in, in a different way. Um, so this is um, usually overlooked, also as an approach to this, as if the city was a monolithic thing that thought itself in the. Um, and also in here, now we kind of looked only at the low, lower Middle Ages, but uh, you have to think that this, in in um, on a smaller scale, actually existed also before. Uh, as we were saying before, the, the early medieval cities, especially in Southern Europe, had their own continuous life. There were aristocracies that uh, descended practically from from that ancient um, uh, urban elite that existed into the uh, late Roman Empire that had also these kind of uh, uh, civil duties and um, administered the city, etc. There were oligarchies, there were aristocracies that had their own great, even civic pr pride. So these were people that were conceiving themselves also not just as, I don't know, subjects of the empire or later of some of some um, Latin Germanic kingdom, but also as, let's say, chives in Latin, these citizens, these, to have a civic pride. It's not because they, they had an egalitarian idea of a democratic uh, asset of the city, but because they, they were the aristocracy of that city. We have beautiful epigraphies uh, from the early medieval times that show us that and that tell us um, because it was a matter of pride I mean sometimes these aristocracies were even wealthier than the ones of the I don't know the Germanic um, uh, rulers that had arrived during the migration era and they s kind of also comforted their action they they also um, partly contributed to <coughs> the process of romanization, of education, of the conquerors, etc. So it's very, very, um, very, very important, uh, in my opinion. The <coughs> excuse me. Well, mm, what else can we say? The there is also a matter of saying, you know, in which time, however, the the cities began really to revive, mm -hmm. because this is also another point. There had been indeed a decline, as we've seen, uh, but when when is that the trend gets inverted? Mm -hmm. It's kind of a mathematical thing. Obviously, we can't measure it properly because we don't have the, the sources for, for doing that, but uh, when is that really the city begins to work again? Especially um, because there have people that have said, well, you know what, Piran might have been wrong uh, to have said things in a kind of too sharp way, and some, some, of, some of what he said it was definitely wrong in many ways, but um, there are certain concepts as I was saying before, relatively to the reconsideration of the older aristocracy, that, however, were not really wrong. I mean, if you think especially at the commercial importance of the city, you cannot argue really that 
the medieval times the, the city had this eminently commercial function uh, uh, especially given the, um, the really the way through which it had developed I mean we've seen how complex it, complex it really was but uh, for instance Europe has this dualism of the feudality of the feudal system that it's mostly something and necessarily rurally based mm -hmm. just like the city was rurally based but it was another model you know one thing is living in a castle in the countryside one thing is living in a city so the feudal system even from a political point of view even from a military point of view was kind of challenged eventually to the low middle ages by the rise of the cities mm -hmm. um, and this could be really pretty dual Think about, for instance, into Germany, um, into the Holy Roman Empire, to say better, that uh, the Germans wanted to um, obviously revive their empire to strengthen their monarchy. Um, I mean, the Germans really didn't want, most of Germans really didn't want to, but I mean, dynasties like the Oenstaufen, for instance, wanted to do that. So a very good way to, to stamp the um the no say the nobility's expansion was to build to to grant city rights to to certain um centers that um got also s certain privileges attached with that the so called um freie reichsstädte so the uh, free cities of the empire mm -hmm. and the 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 idea of this is you you use a city that is something that really is extraneous to the feudal mentality of of um, fa dynasties like the Barbarossa's. Uh, if you think about the fight, definitely uh, this is the point that he carried out against the Lombard League. It was a league of cities, mm -hmm. but it's still was known he I mean th they still knew how to use it in their own at their own advantage and therefore the Swabians fight so harshly into Italy against cities because they didn't conceive them as you know even in their feudal mi you know in the feudal mindset of the emperors as uh, they considered them anomalies but at the same time they needed those cities because for instance those cities were um, uh, reviving uh, Roman law at that time, and the emperor was extremely fascinated by that because it w the Roman law stressed um, the imperial superiority um, and imperial prerogative over the church. Mm -hmm. And we are at the time of the struggle for between papacy and empire. So you see the city that intervenes uh, and, and is really fr unavoidably framed into the political and social system of of Europe and even if it is something radically different from the feudal world I mean not I can't say radically really but it was different sometimes also culturally given the the areas of origin of, of feudalism for instance but the the, the idea is the city kind of built its own universe mm. its universe on its own so it's it's also very important to understand even the limits of this mindset huh? because the cities eventually uh, were defeated after all um, in um, I mean it's difficult to, to express something like a concept like mine <laughs> Uh, would be criticized as much as Pirates was. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, eventually the cities um, in the lower Middle Ages especially kind you know, there is this big crack of the Black Death that really makes the same also urban economy collapse in part. And this doesn't mean that cities were not important at all. You can argue that, especially towards the lower Middle and late Middle Ages, the city increases in I its importance, especially because um, and also during the modern age, because uh, naturally, with especially with the expansion of the 
during the age of exploration that started to become um, very important centers to control from the crown. Mm. This is also interesting, and during the Middle Ages were kind of multi it, it probably the the political geography of, of cities was much more complex while towards the late middle ages there are certain cities that kind of emerge over the others this is evident actually in, uh, at so many levels <coughs> so that you had even single city uh, i mean certain regional powers that gravitated around a city state that had managed to to subju subjugate all the surrounding cities um the so even the crowns of the major feudal monarchies were interested in these major centers that were forming in as economical centers as uh, trade centers as agricultural centers um and that had in fact their their role you can argue in in uh, in the kingdom um the kingdoms um unity also in part because having a city against you was something pretty serious there is france is a beautiful example of this because france was a <coughs> typically feudal kingdom but it still had very large and important cities um and i don't know centers like Caen, um or and and and, and by the way <coughs> and these were all um still cities that considered themselves as kind of states on their own. This is a tradition that especially in Germany has survived. I mean the idea, you know, if you go to Hamburg or to Bremen that they think they are they are actually states on their own. Even in the feudal in, in the feudal in the federal system of Germany, well Germany is made up by certain states and some of them are still city states like the ones we I, 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 I recall now. Because that dates back to that point to that feudal tradition to which the city was a sort of um, um, uh, body on its own and therefore interacted freely according to what the political culture at the time really was with the um, with the sovereign um, this makes me feel uh, the need of talking about modern history more on Schwerpunkt because that is a crucial passage also to, to understand. But to say that the essentials actually were set now also in, in the late Middle Ages um, as society had crystallized and um, naturally also in here there were certain, s uh, just like uh, it happened to the individuals, there were certain cities that kind of rose to the top and be, uh, became uh, immensely rich and the majority of the others kind of got grow um, kind of grew sub subservient to that also economically speaking and function the were cities who founded other cities especially ports um, so this is all very uh, very important to to stress and always given that the origins of the cities were extremely varied and uh, it's very interesting to look at the also the geography of this um, but I don't think we have much time so um, for now I hope uh, okay I think I've said everything I wanted um, the for now I just hope that you enjoyed this video and if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents and for now uh, I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.